On schedule is Drew, who will be talking about KVM uh, on arms. Drew? Alright, glad to see everybody made it back from lunch or last session. Um, so, maybe you can see by my cover slide here that we're going to try to compare um, ARM and Intel in this talk. And we're going to look at it from a very specific perspective at a very limited scope, but uh, it should be still fun to, to try to draw some sort of conclusions. And uh, uh, before we do that, though, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'll do, uh, I'll do an introduction of the terminology that's going to be involved. I'll do a small introduction of the technology that's going to be involved. And then I'll explain the scope of the comparison um, as much as possible. And then we'll go ahead and do the comparison and draw our conclusions or not. <clears throat> All right, so just to start off with an easy one, that's about the most classic definition I could come up with for an operating system. Um, it's not actually the definition my mom would use. She would use this one. <laughs> but actually, this is the one that I want to use. Um, so for me, uh, working on the hypervisor, the operating system is what I want to run. And what I want to know is what it wants to be able to do and, and what kind of interface it's going to have at the lower level, the hypervisor level. So what what an operating system is to me is software that wants full access to the hardware, which we can't grant in <coughs> virtualization. Um, because we actually want to do the, the exact opposite. We want to take that unmodified operating system that's used to having access to full hardware and run it in a restricted environment. And um, the way we do that the mechanism for that is a hypervisor, and you might notice the classic definition is almost the same thing as the classic of the operating system. 
And if my mom knew what a hypervisor was, then I guess that would be her definition. <laughs> So, but actually what I want to talk more about today are virtualization extensions, that and the hypervisor, uh, because this is a talk about architecture. So uh, we don't want to be too high up in the software land because at that point we don't care if we're on ARM or if we're on, uh, on uh, the latest Intel. Uh, so virtualization extensions are part of the processor, the spec for the processor that allow you to... to uh, to be able to virtualize those operating systems, to be able to run those operating systems that expect full access to the hardware in a restricted environment in a more easy way than having to rewrite them um, so they actually know they're in a restricted environment or do some crazy uh, patching off of uh, basic traps that you would have in your normal operating system like, uh, like some uh, other hypervisors do or did in the past. Uh, so, but what, what question is left then is how well do they assist? And that's, and that's the question that you can ask of more than one architecture at a time. So you can try to compare them. Uh, but like I said, we're going to be looking at this from one narrow perspective. Uh, there are lots of ways you'll be able to look at this question. And, uh, and many of them are very interesting. And many of them, or almost all of them, we're not looking at. Uh, so still, we're in our introduction phase here uh, because we also need to understand a little bit about the hypervisor that we care about for this comparison, and that one is going to be KVM. KVM's design is important to us. Um, well, any hypervisor we choose for this comparison would be important to us to know its design, and KVM's design uh, is one that tries to do the minimal amount of, as possible. It, from the beginning, when it was first designed, uh, it only wanted to take the virtualization extensions that we already mentioned and enable them and do almost nothing else. And the way it does that but still meets that definition we had, which almost looked the same thing as an operating system definition, is to leave all of the operating system type stuff, all the management of those resources, to an operating system. And um, one particular operating system was chosen for KVM, which I don't know if you know, um, but uh, maybe you guessed it's Linux. And so KVM is a module for this operating system. And the thing is, we, we still need to be able to um, remember that this, this software we're running, this guest OS, uh, is going to try to do all sorts of stuff with what it thinks is its hardware. It's going to poke registers um, that we expose to it, um, and it's going to think that those pokes and are actually going to work. And so we, we end up exposing this really big interface um, <clears throat> that we need to be able to, to intercept all the, all the different uh, uh, accesses to in order to respond correctly. And if we're using some sort of hardware, uh, for example, uh, UART, uh, which can be emulated, then you have only a handful of registers, but this can keep adding up and adding up, and pretty soon your KVM module would be massive. Uh, so KVM's philosophy is also to leave all that stuff to an emulator, which already uh, was available at the time. And... Um, focus on enabling those virtualization extensions of the processor and fill in all the gaps, connecting everything together. So, so now we're back, back to bird extensions again, but now we'll actually start looking at uh, specifically uh, each architecture, what they have to offer. <clears throat> um, so Intel has been evolving their, their bird extensions over quite some time now, at least 10 years, uh, getting it to where it is today. So in 2005, they released, and they had some, uh, they had virtualization extensions, and, but they b basically allowed you to launch a guest, and then the guest would trap, and pretty much everything else you needed to emulate uh, in the hypervisor. It, 
became quite clear very early on that if you were to emulate all the page table management, um, then you would have a huge bottleneck uh, trying to do all the shadow page table stuff. So they added an extension, uh, which is I'll get to more later in a different slide, called uh, extended page tables. And then they also had this little problem where every time you wanted to boot uh, a guest, you had to emulate everything. So you're actually uh, not taking advantage of, of vert extensions for the very beginning of the guest boot because the guest wanted to boot in real mode. Uh, an Intel guest always needs to boot in real mode. It's the way it's been forever. Uh, backward compatibility thing. And so they didn't have support for that, though, with their, their extensions. So it, you just had to emulate it all. And so a few years ago, they, they came up with a thing called unrestricted guest, which allows you to, to also avoid that problem. Um, and then more recently, uh, interrupt injection and being able to uh, have the guest acknowledge an interrupt uh, with re reduction in number of traps uh, has been the focus. <laughs> and uh, they also have that. Well, uh, so what about ARM? ARM released its vert extensions uh, not too long ago, like 2013. Uh, so roughly this same time that some of the later innovations from Intel were coming out. Uh, first, they, in a way, they were sort of previewing it in their 32-bit uh, with LPAE extension, um, uh, uh, ARM v7. I don't know how much it's going to be used, maybe, maybe more than I expect, but uh, it's actually the same extensions, more or less, um, that they have for the V7 and the V8. So in the V7, it was an optional that came out with the Cortex A15, and, uh, and in the V8, it's, it's their standard. So the things that it has, uh, I call this second state translation instead of EPT because I'm not actually sure, but I think EPT is an Intel trademarky thing, so I don't want to use it, but it's, it's extended page tables. Um, and then they have the virtual um, generic interrupt controller, which is very similar to this. <clears throat> and they also allow you to boot um, with the MMU off. From, uh, so they have that. And of course, they have vert extensions that allow you to virtualize the CPU. So they actually have this whole list from the beginning. There are some things missing that we're going to get to in more detail a little bit later. But those should be resolved as well in the <coughs> near future. And I'll, I'll just leave that acronym for now until we get back to it. <clears throat> OK, we're still in the intro. Um, because now we need to talk about how a guest runs and, and what we do when we're running and uh, that involves vert extensions, um, so we can actually consider them. So we start a guest somehow, and that, that's a variable depending on uh, the architecture and, or the release of the architecture even. And then the guest gets to run, and so it's just running along. And, and the whole point of, of using vert extensions instead of peer emulation is so that the guest's code is running on the actual CPU, which is going to run as fast as it would if it was not virtualized until it hits something that it's not supposed to do. Because like we said, it thinks it has full access of the hardware, but it doesn't. So it's running along, doing what it wants. And then it needs to access something that it's not supposed to, so it needs to trap. And so we trap into the hypervisor. And we need to handle that somehow. Maybe some emulation, whatever. We either handle it in kernel mode, because that's where we head to immediately into KVM. Or if KVM decides it's something it wants to defer, uh, such as emulating that UART, that there's no point in having the whole UART emulation embedded in the kernel, it'll actually defer that to user, user mode. So that'll actually go to QEM. In either case, the thing will get handled one way or another. And we'll go back to entering the guest. We'll go back to executing the guest. And eventually, we'll trap again. And we just keep doing this all the time. 
<clears throat> All right. And now this is a little bit more about the EPT, or it will be. This is your standard uh, setup for page paging. So you have, this is a, just a normal OS. You have your physical memory. You have your processes running. And you have these page tables that allow you to change the virtual memory of the processes into physical memory translation. And the operating system manages these for you. So if you have uh, only one processor in this example, then you need to be swa uh, context switching between these guys. If there was two processors, they could be running together. Uh, but probably other processes that you would context switch with. <clears throat> for virtualization, you have the exact same thing, but embedded inside a VM. And if it was just one VM, it wouldn't really make a whole lot of difference whether it was on the bare metal or virtualized. You could actually do it this way, but generally there would be more. And so now we end up in a situation where you would have to always be uh, taking this entire page table and swapping it in and out if you had to trade with this guy back and forth. So you would be doing what was called shadow page table management, and this would be your major source of overhead. But it's actually not too hard to see that the way you can avoid that is simply to extend the page tables with another set of page tables. So these arrows here coming out are what the guest thinks is physical memory. It's what they, the, the operating system has allowed, or the MMU, uh, for the operating system program, has told these processes their virtual addresses, and, and they have looked up their physical addresses, and there they are. But it's not really true because we're in a virtualized environment. These are intermediate addresses that haven't actually, that don't necessarily match directly to the physical memory. Well, they can, but they don't have to. They can go anywhere they want, uh, whatever the hypervisor decides. Maybe those pages are even swapped out. Uh, the guest thinks they're physical, but they're, they're not. And so, but it's easy to just go ahead and take a physical address or a guest physical address and pretend that it's a virtual address and then send it back through a page table translation and pop out and get a real physical address final. So that's what the extended page table concept means. We just double it. <clears throat> uh, this, this image is just showing that if we weren't uh, running with the MMU enabled, then we would simply be using physical addresses directly, probably from a bootloader is why I wrote that there. And uh, we'll still be able to use page translation on the second stage, the hypervisor stage. So these physical addresses here will still become translated to truly physical addresses, these guest physical to, to host physical. Finally, I think we've gone through all the concepts involved in the comparison, and we can try to scope the comparison a little bit, uh, because there's a lot. Um, I did my best to narrow it down um, to one fairly small thing. So here's what is not. <clears throat> it's not going to be a power comparison. I know that's probably what 50% of you or more wanted to see. Because every time the word ARM is thrown around, you want to know how much power are we saving with it, because that's what the hype is about. Well, I didn't even consider it. It's not a performance comparison either. Um, you can maybe make some inferences about what could perform better or worse just by looking at how things are done. But I didn't actually do any cycle measurements. I didn't try to do a fair cycle measurement, which would even be harder when you compare two architectures. Um, and probably the most interesting metric, it definitely is not, which would be the product of the performance and the power, which someday would be great to do, but not today. Uh, it's not even a functional comparison. So I already showed, though, that uh, they pretty much have functional parity. ARM came out with uh, a release that will show uh, that, that had all the features that Intel has evolved over the last 10 years. These guys wanted perf uh, power or performance or both. <laughs> or functionality. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, 
there isn't a lot of point in trying to point out exactly uh, what part of APIC V is implemented in VGIC or what part of VGIC is not implemented in APIC V. It could also be quite interesting, uh, but it would actually be something that would basically just be showing the PDFs of the two specs and pointing at the, I don't know how well that, would, that talk would go. Uh, so like I said, we already saw that they're more or less the same anyway. Um, so since this is DEF CONF, I decided to actually look at it from developer perspective. Um, so we need to make KVM run on both Intel machines and their, on their processors with their vertical extensions, and we also need to make it work on ARM-based uh, uh, designs. So, on the V8 particularly. And so, what kinds of pain are we going to have uh, trying to do one or the other? Is something kind of interesting to a developer. Uh, basically, how easy are these extensions to use or not use? And yes, there's this really cool stuff like the APIC V, which I kind of wanted to address today, but it's not going to happen. And then, um, so what I did was I limited it to the CPU and the virtual memory, which we just described uh, in the intro in detail. And of course, I limited it to the kernel space because it doesn't really make much sense to talk about how QEMU will emulate the two. It's the same anyway. Um, <clears throat> and then I tried to limit the amount of code we look at because KVM has a bunch of code. Um, and so I decided to try to narrow things down to a set of paths that are quite obviously necessary. So the paths that are required to be able to boot a guest at all. So you, you get the guest up and you program the MMU. And when you do that, well, you're going to have a series of traps in the hypervisor before that actually is going to work. And so that series of traps that... Uh, that you take to the hypervisor will run a series of different handlers, and that series of different handlers may tell us something about, if we look at those handlers, may tell us something about how working with these vert extensions for these different architectures um, is different. Well, this is your eye chart. Um, you in the back, please read. No, it, you don't have to read it. Uh, this is just proof that I actually did do what I just said. <laughs> um, I did actually trace the booting of a simple guest, and I, well, I filtered thousands of these. But uh, what I filtered it down to in both cases was the critical beginning when you first start executing after the bootloader. I cut the bootloaders out because it wouldn't be fair anyway. Um, for, yeah, for Intel, it, it, it does tons of stuff, thousands and thousands of traps. Um, and uh, for ARM, if you just boot it straight from QEMU, it does pretty much nothing. So uh, to make them fair, I started them both as we're entering our own guest code, um, setting a few things up, most importantly, enabling the MMU. And, Continuing. So, handlers. Um, so we saw, to go back, I will point at a couple things. So we see what kinds of traps we're taking here. Uh, EPT violation, page fault. Trying to access some privileged registers. And another page fault there. So I wanted to look at the handlers for the page fault for the accessing of privileged regi uh, registers. And so I did. And this is not the KVM code. <laughs> this is a actually probably criminally simplified version of KVM code. <laughs> but I left in the parts that matter. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so this is for Intel only, VMX. And um, here's that page fault we had at the beginning, which is actually very expected. We don't have our MMU on yet. Um, and so we need to trap in uh, 
uh, what we're going to run, and we're going to go ahead and do that with this. And what we see right away is that there's this funny VMCS thingy um, with some exit qualification and another VMS thingy, uh, which is actually fairly obvious what that is. Uh, we're trying to get that intermediate address, the guest physical one. It's not a truly physical one. It's before we've translated on the second stage. And then we need to go ahead and actually fault that in and be able to return to the guest with it ready for the guest to use. Possibly we need to go into QEMU here. Um, so these VMCS things I'll get back to in a second. Uh, they're good to keep in mind because those are VMX related. Down here, this is when we tried to access the privilege register. VMCS thingy back again. Uh, decoding the stuff we get out of there. And this is a overly simplified, of course, but uh, you can see the point. So we're trying to access the CR 0, 3, and 4 registers. So we end up with um, exactly what you would expect when you enable the MMU is CR 0. We need to eventually call into some sort of an MMU enablement. When you install the page directory with CR3, you'll need to eventually do something like that for real. So this is what's happening for real in the hypervisor. This is actually able to talk to the hardware. Uh, the guest thought it was, and we're doing stuff on its behalf. This is emulation as well as being able to keep track of the state so we can run another VM and swap all this stuff out and put another one in. Or DCPU to be more precise, and CR4 for features. Uh, we are also trying to access some MSRs. <clears throat> I only put the read, a pseudocode simplified version of read here, because you can easily guess what the write would look like. Again, VMCS stuff. So we're pulling stuff out of VMCS, uh, VMCS all the time for VMX. Now, what is that? So um, with VMX, with Intel's Vert extensions, uh, their design is to have a huge amount of, or not a huge amount, but quite a bit of state per vCPU. So every time you put a guest, uh, you start a guest uh, running in guest mode, or a set of code, that operating system that wants to have full access but needs restricted access. Um, you also have this piece, this, this uh, structure of state, this register bank of state that you install. So you can switch into guest mode, and then when you come back to, to uh, hypervisor mode, you'll be able to access stuff from it as well that gets automatically placed there. Guest state is what you might expect. It's all the guest registers, uh, a bunch of other interrupt state, whatnot. Host state is the equivalent on the host side. Trap controls allow you to decide uh, what's going to trap, because not everything must trap. Um, mo many things must trap, but then there are some optional things that you can allow the guest to go ahead and do uh, at your discretion, and so you don't bother trapping it. You don't need to know. Uh, these two are, are uh, somewhat of a method for optimizing. You can actually... Uh, specify a certain set of MSRs that will get automatically um, uh, pushed in and out of your VMCS when you, when you load a vCPU and when it traps back out. And here's actually information that corresponds to, to what uh, we saw there was that exit qualification. You can get stuff like your, the address uh, that the guest was trying to access the guest physical address. Um, oops, I think that might be out of sync. I'll go back for that one. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> now let's look at the ARM handlers that, that relate to um, uh, what we saw in its trace. So if you recall, we also saw, maybe I'll just go up there. <clears throat> We also saw page faults, and we saw, saw this funny thing, uh, toggling cache. 
These traces are actually not the exact traps. They don't say exit like they do here. Uh, I cut out that just for shrinking it. But uh, so we're trapping on page faults. That's normal. And here, these are actually traps on on uh, register rights, privilege registers. So let's see what that means. <clears throat> so when we do page file handling on the ARM side in the hypervisor, we don't see any of that VMCS stuff for starters because it's a Intel thing. We pull that information out of the out of a VCP structure, which I'll get to later on how it would get there. Um, we still have very very similar uh, code like we would have, like we do have on the Intel side, where we need to decide if we go to QMU or not. But now we have some funny stuff here, which was not on the uh, equivalent pseudo criminally reduced KVM Intel version. This I can't just rip out of here and simplify stuff because it's kind of an important thing to talk about. Um, what we're doing here is uh, making sure that while we're running with the MMU off or uh, <clears throat> running a guest that has memory set in its page table, so the MMU is on, it has page tables installed, but the pages that it's referencing in this page fault are set as uh, uncached. So it's not using the cache, uh, it, or it thinks it's not using the cache, uh, because it thinks it's a device most typically. For, for that reason, it, wants, it doesn't want to cache the access. Um, in those cases, we have to actually watch for that and make sure we flush that cache, because on the host side, we could actually be using the cache. So we're we're mapping a guest physical address to a host uh, physical address, which that host physical address may actually be pointing to normal memory, and there's no reason not to have the cache turned on. But if the guest thinks it's uncached, um, it's writing directly to the memory, and if we're actually doing a write from the host, like, uh, for example, from QMU, which is uh, now on the host side instead of the guest side, where it thinks the memory is cached, then that write is going to get stuck in the cache. And the guest is going to read directly from memory. Because remember, we're using uh, extended page table in MU, which doesn't necessarily involve the hypervisor's code. So the hardware just gives you the, the memory. But it bypasses what, what actually was written there by the host. And now we're, we're looking at the wrong thing. That's messy. Um, and something that's worth pointing out. So I did. Uh, this is actually also messy. <coughs> this particular, I made that up, pseudo code. It's, uh, of course, named something else. Don't try to grep for these function names. Um, it's, uh, this is actually a, a heuristic in KVM right now. Basically, we assume that if a guest set up uh, a region is read only, um, then, or we know if it's set up directly to true MMIO space that it's device and uncached. But if it's set up to something that's not necessarily truly I/O, which we actually have backed with normal RAM, which is cached, uh, it can still possibly be something the guest thinks is is uh, is uh, hardware. For example, a flash chip. If we give it an emulator chip, but it's the best you can really do without actually starting at the uh, page directory of the guest, which you can find, of course, and then doing a whole page table walk manually, looking for the for the page table entry that refers to this address that we're faulting on, and then checking its attributes to see if they had actually said that it was uncached. And, well, that's going to be too much overhead and a lot of work, so it's not being done right now in KVM, so it's not perfect, but that's about the best we can do with this particular um, design that ARM has. Now, these are accessing the, the uh, privilege registers, same as on the Intel side. We also had traps for that, and that's 
Of course, because uh, we were setting up the MMU, to set up the MMU requires this uh, privilege register uh, manipulation. Uh, and you'll see that uh, this cache thingy is back in here again. Uh, in this case, it's, it's actually not so different than on Intel, probably. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how the unrestricted guest stuff works. But um, you're going to have to trap all the time, I imagine, until you have your MMU turned on anyway. And that's what's going on here. We've, we've told, uh, we've set the, uh, the trap flag that says we want to trap on virtual memory related accesses to registers, uh, virtual memory related privilege registers. That's what this thing does. And we want to trap all of them. Just every single time we hit one of these registers, we're going to trap, uh, which is why you see four of them in a row. And if you can read that, you see that three of them did nothing, changed, and we finally changed. Um, it's because the first three were setting things up for the uh, uh, MMU to be enabled. The last one enabled it. And once it's enabled, we turn that trap bit off, and we no longer worry about it anymore. But if we, if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't know that we need to invalidate the caches. Um, wow, I didn't realize I was running out of time because I missed the 10-minute one, I guess. Uh, we didn't realize we'd invalidate the caches uh, or the... Uh, uh, or actually flush them when we turn the MMU back off again. Okay, so the reason for this is actually an architectural design thing. This is, this is actually a pseudocode directly from the ARM ARM. Um, well, I manipulated it again. I take my liberty with my variable names. Um, but uh, basically what it says here is that as long as one stage of that page table translation, remember we have two stages, uh, chooses non-cached, then we treat it as non-cached. And this is maybe not a great plan. OK. <clears throat> uh, so this is just a review of that, because I wanted to talk about uh, exactly, exactly what's happening when we trap, since we kind of left out a big detail there. We just jumped straight from traces of traps to handlers. But uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, to get into that handler. And I have to go really fast, apparently, unfortunately. Um, so, Intel side. This is it, actually. So we can do this fast. You do some stuff. You handle the exit in here. You have to do a little bit of assembly code for managing registers and launching the disk. Um, ARM side. Not so clear what, to, what that's doing. Uh, the start of it looks about the same. Kind of has the same form there. But then we've thrown a bunch of assembly code in there and we have to understand it. Only way to understand that is to actually understand exception levels in V8, which we're going to have to take a 30-second course on here. Um, so we take an exception, we go down, we return, we go back up. We can do this also from the guest OS to the hypervisor. Um, what we have here is we're actually trying to force one of those exceptions to the hypervisor, which comes down here. That, that forces it. And we've thrown this particular uh, function address into the argument. So when we came over here, the vector, we come here when we do the exception. That's our vector handler. Uh, first, we notice that we're actually coming from the host. We didn't come from the guest. So we jump over um, there, or we go to here. And we jump over to our argument that we passed in. And now this looks a lot like that assembler code in the Intel version except for that ERET thing there, but you just saw on the last slide, ERET means go back up. Um, so that means we went back up into EO1, into guest mode, which is what we wanted. Now, that guest is going to eventually trap, and uh, he's going to come to here as well, because when he traps to the hypervisor, he comes to the hypervisor handler. Now, this time, we do see it's a guest, so we're going to go ahead and jump down into here. We'll do the save vCPU stuff, and that's actually uh, where... A lot of that magic happens that we don't need VMCS for. We save a bunch of hypervisor registers, which are the same concept as the VMCS, but uh, in separate registers, all into the state of that vCPU, which we can then access from all of our handlers. Then we hop over to the return, and we, do, we finish this off. But <clears throat> uh, 
it actually gets kind of complicated, and I can show you some animation, the whole sequence. How many transitions we have here. And this one's a more interesting one. So when we came down here, we, were, we just got into hypervisor mode again, and we're returning from that exception. But how is it we got over here? We got over here because we, we, we stored these host registers up here, and then we restored them here. So that ends up being the link register that we need. And now we're doing another ERET. So that's weird, right? We were wanting to handle our hypervisor exception. We got trapped from the guest, and we're in the hypervisor, and we want to handle it. But now we just went back to, back to uh, the guest mode. Now, we went to the host, but we went to exception level one. And we came back to here, which actually leads us back here. And that's how we got there. So this is exception level one, which we got to because of this guy coming back to here, coming back to here. And so if you actually look at this... <laughs> That's how it looks. And if you look at it in this form, you can see what's going on. First, when we boot up a KVM uh, host on an AR64 architecture, we boot in hypervisor mode, EL2. Then we actually go here to EL1, which is still the host, though. We want to run in this mode, and I will tell you why if I have time. Then we we will actually uh, launch the guest from this mode, doing what we do with QMU. We need some help from the hypervisor to do so. Finally, we run the guest, and we run Facebook. And then we go back when we have a trap, and we end up here to handle the trap, and we return, blah, 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 blah. We just do this all the time. And that's kind of strange, right? Um, why did we do that? And the reason is because of an uh, architectural issue with the verdict center. So, not everything can be done in hypervisor mode that can be done in uh, EL1. And EL2 is not actually out of time, <laughs> um, is not actually a full um, set of the same instructions as EL1. So. What we need in Linux, uh, or what Linux wants to use to run, a, run the uh, host, uh, requires us to be in EL1, and that's why we have to go there uh, to actually use KVM's design the way it is, which is Linux for everything except uh, starting and running a guest, and then KVM only when necessary. So it's a KVM slash AR64, somewhat, you could almost say, incompatibility that requires that. Uh, jumping around, and that returns me to what I left undefined earlier on, which is virtualization host extensions, and that will allow us to do all the handling in KVM in hypervisor mode and stop the swinging, ping-ponging thinging, and those are just things I already said. So, um, we're out of time. I don't even know if we have time for questions. Did I use up everything? Sorry. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to find me. I'm not going to go anywhere. So, thank you.
because they're hypervisor is uh, completely written from scratch for ARM, uh -huh. and they can actually find ways to run their domains, uh, their Zen domains, uh, without having to. Uh, they do have their own like Linux Dome Zero thing that helps a lot, but they don't actually have to go there for, for what they do. They, they do it from Zen. I didn't understand this part. Zen is, well, I mean, the, the, essentially, it's the same thing, right? Whatever you're using, I mean, whatever virtualization.